Welcome to Cinema of Meaning, a podcast from myself, Thomas Flight, and my fellow video essayist, Tom Vanderlinden, from the channel Like Stories of Old, that seeks to explore the depth of what cinema has to offer. This week, we're going to be talking about Werner Herzog's renowned documentary, Grizzly Man, probably his most well-known work. But before we get into that, I want to mention Nebula really quickly. Nebula is our creator-owned streaming service that's made for creators by creators. And this podcast is a Nebula original, which means two things. You can listen to every episode an entire week early and without any ads or sponsorships. And you can also get exclusive bonus episodes, one each month. We recently talked about Damien Chazelle's Babylon, and there's a bunch of other great films that we've discussed on there. You can get access to all of that, the bonus films and the early episodes when you listen on Nebula. Nebula gives you uh, an RSS feed that you can plug into your podcast player so you can listen where you normally do, uh, but you get access to the extra stuff. So there's a link in the description, or you can go to nebula.tv slash cinema of meaning to sign up for Nebula and listen that way. And that supports the podcast. This film is maybe Herzog's most recognized film, I think. Mm -hmm. This was my introduction to him back in the day. Uh, and I think it probably is for a lot of people. If I bring up Herzog, most people are like, oh, Grizzly Man. So it had been it yep. had been a long time since I watched this. And the last time I watched this, it was the literally the first Herzog film I was I was ever watching. So it was really fun to kind of come back to this, you know, maybe even a decade later. And also kind of with all the knowledge I now have of sort of Herzog and his philosophy and approach to filmmaking and all his other films. And I remember really enjoying it the first time, but I was struck the second time around just by how most of what I remembered, I think, was the story, the specific beats of kind of the details of the man, Timothy Treadwell. Mm -hmm. But I was really struck this time around how Herzog it is and how, you know, I don't know, there's so much of his idiosyncrasies in here. So this was your recommendation to discuss. This is a film about a man who lives with grizzly bears. I should say, at least in the U.S., you can watch this for free on YouTube. So if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend just checking it out. There's no excuse. You can just watch it. Yeah, if oh, you really? haven't seen That's Grizzly Man, go watch it. But we're going to dive into this story. Tom, this was your recommendation. What, what made you want to return to Grizzly Man? Yeah, like you said, I think it's his most mainstream film. It's the one that most people have seen. And I actually don't remember what my first encounter with Herzog was. I think it might have been Grizzly Man as well. It, it's so fascinating that this is both his most popular movie and also distinctively Herzogian film. Like all the elements yes. that you see in his other films or especially his documentaries, you can also find in this one. So in that sense, it's it's also a great introduction to his other works. I, I once did a, like a director's profile on him for which I watched like 40 of his films. Like I tried to watch every one that I could find. And <laughs> right, yeah. he's been such a fascinating filmmaker to me, which such a unique philosophy, a unique approach to filmmaking and to the concept of truth in filmmaking. And that's what I also remember from Grizzly Man. Like the, what stood out to me was not so much the account of, Timothy Treadwell, although that too was obviously uh, very impactful, just the whole story, the kind of irony of it all, but also the yeah. way, like that's something I had never seen before, is the way Herzog would kind of inject his own beliefs, his own thoughts on what he was making a movie about, like he would literally interrupt the movie to say like, oh, this is where I, for this I admire Timothy, I yeah. love the way he does this, or now, at this point, I differ with him. Like, my philosophy is such and such. And that, to me, was so unusual for a documentary where you kind of expect the filmmaker to be kind of on the sideline or be more of this fly on the wall, this kind of objective presence that tries to right. portray the story as neutral as possible. And then here you have Herzog who just kind of barges in with like, well, this is the story, <laughs> but I think so and so. And you're going yeah. to hear about that too. There's something interesting there that I definitely want to get into a little bit in how kind of Herzog handles sort of myth making where mm, yeah. it feels like he's he's definitely sort of addressing Timothy's own sense of kind of mythologizing himself or sort of the narratives that 
Timothy is engaging in and isn't just blindly embracing those narratives or portraying them as true. He's kind of showing them to the viewer with a little bit, a tiny bit of like a skepticism, but he's also unabashedly engaging kind of in his own myth making. Mm -hmm. If you know anything about Herzog, you know he loves to sort of poeticize things and create this kind of narrative out of things as well. So he exists like in this very weird, I would call it almost like a meta modern kind of like place where it's not distinctly postmodern. Like he mm-hmm. he likes kind of poking holes in narrative in the way that like you expect from a postmodernist like filmmaker or something. But he he doesn't then go and say like, oh, we gotta throw narrative out entirely. He is still like, but I like this, I like this different. Like I'm gonna poke holes in this narrative, but then use that to my own advantage to just like openly Hmm. like give you my my myth that I like um and he's very like transparent about doing that I think and I can yeah. see that a lot in this in this film which I, th- I think is very fascinating well yeah he can also be kind of obscure in the in the things he does stylize he's kind of infamous for sure. yeah yeah staging elements in his documentaries that aren't in this movie, you can obviously see the scene with like the coroner and and that conversation with his ex girlfriend, where the the coroner gives her his uh, Timothy's watch. It feels right. You can right. feel the awkwardness of the setup. You can feel that it's artificial. But there's yeah. in his other documentaries, there's scenes that are entirely fictional. But even though you you're not fully aware that you're watching fiction, like he has a yes. more obscure documentary that was called Bells from the Deep which is about religion in Russia. And there's this scene where he kind of explains this local folktale about like a deep lake. And if there's like ice on it, like the people will lie on their bellies on the lake to try and peer through the ice where it's suspected like that. If you do that long enough, you'll see like a hidden city beneath the ice. And then apparently like that whole thing was just made up. Like he had actors like, (laughs) or like the local citizens do that, but it's not, it was kind of, a way for him to illustrate a sort of deeper truth, even though he could not could not like factually observe it or like objectively. And he does that right. all the time, basically. Does that other documentary, um, Little Dieter Needs to Fly, about this Vietnam pilot who crashed and was captured. And he interviews him and he goes to his home. Uh, he survives, so he, this is 10 years later. Uh, he goes to visit this pilot and... He shows him going into his home and then always opening and closing the door a couple of times to make sure he, or it's said that he does this to make sure that he can still get out, you know, because of the trauma of feeling trapped in that prison again. But even that, like he got this, that was apparently like fictional. That's not something that this guy actually did. Just right. heard, like, somehow, somehow convinced him to do that just to illustrate some kind of deeper point. And I think in, in that sense, I, I'm not sure if I would describe him as post-modern necessarily. I think he actually like in some ways rejects postmodernism, or at least he, he's very critical of the cinema verite, which is this documentary movement that arose like in the 60s where right. you had these, at first at least, French documentarians who were trying to get a more objective portrait or an objective capture a more objective truth in the documentaries and they did that by kind of drawing attention to the camera and by emphasizing that they have limited perspectives and um in that sense to be as much as they can like a fly on the wall that's something that i know herzog has specifically rejected like he says this is one of the many funny quotes he has but like we should not be flies on the walls we should be the the bees that sting right right <laughs> I'm using terms that maybe aren't like clearly defined in in yeah. filmmaking. Metamodernism is a movement that I think exists in filmmaking that I haven't mm-hmm. that not a lot of people have talked about yet and that I'm kind of working on some stuff to kind of outline what I think that means and so I guess I can't throw that term around yet. I need to do some of the more of the groundwork in describing what I think that means. I think the the metamoderns they come after the postmoderns, right? Or that's They've also been described as like post yes. post modern post yeah. post modern yeah meta modernism is kind of a a form of post post modernism but what I mean by that is like I think you're right in that Herzog is kind of a rejection of post modernism like 
And that's sort of what I see metamodernism as is mm-hmm. like this thing that comes after, but it can't, it can't sort of like, it doesn't try to ignore sort of the pieces of postmodernism that are a little bit deconstructing of narrative or that, or that mm-hmm. sort of like draw a meta awareness to the building of myth and, um, and to your own subjectivity. And so like, uh, Herzog is kind of embracing that. Uh, those subjective elements while still engaging in yeah, sort of yeah, like yeah. pre in the sort of the more modernist or like pre-modernist like narrative he's rejecting postmodernism in the sense that he wants to keep narratives and like myth making but it's also like he's doing that in a post postmodern way where he's like also drawing attention to the fact that he's kind of explicit Mm -hmm. or I guess your point is that he's not always drawing attention to it, which I think is fair. There's a lot of films where he just, he's just like crafting a myth and Mm -hmm. isn't saying like, look, I'm lying about this. I think in this film, it is interesting because it seems to me, maybe I'm just reading this into it because I'm thinking about these themes in his work. In this film, it seems to me like he is kind of drawing a little bit of attention to his own sort of machinations a little bit which I think we can get into, but I, maybe we should like lay some groundwork and then we can come back, maybe put a pin in this part of the discussion and come back to it because I have some specific examples, but those will make yeah, more sure. sense if we kind of lay some of the groundwork. So Timothy Treadwell is this guy who went and lived during the summers in the Alaskan Peninsula with grizzly bears. And he's this fascinating character. And he, spoiler alert, dies gets killed by a bear herzog mm-hmm. kind of like embraces that dramatic tension or like that from the very first frame he doesn't like explicitly come out but yeah. like the first thing you see is timothy this huge bear timothy's kind of talking about like death and things like that and like there's a title card that like shows like the date he was born and the day he died so it's like so kind of like a cruel sense of irony there already because that's yes. the moment that struck me this time around that he's Timothy's just going on and on about the dangers of the bear, but also that he's not going to be the one that's killed by him. And then and there's this like little bits of little bit of text that just casually states like, yes, yeah. he was in fact killed by bears. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That struck me like the way this is set up struck me as particularly like th- this is where we get the first that irony, but also Herzog just dives straight into the deep end. He's not like, yeah. this is a fun story about, uh, or this is like a, a an intriguing human interest story about a man who kind of tragically gets like killed by the thing that he loves so much. Mm-hmm. That's in there. But but like from the from the get-go, Herzog is like, this is this is a story about the absurdity of nature and like con- our confrontation with death. He's like yeah. coming out the gate, kind of like setting up those themes yeah. i think yeah it's, i think it's very much his death is not like the outcome of the story but very much the premise of it and like the, the yes. point from which we kind of go back and look at the because there's an inherent conflict and i like just in the irony between him loving bears while being also killed by one but also immediately between his whole philosophy of nature and the kind of balance that exists in the universe where there's a sort of natural harmony that he tries to be a part of. And then yeah. with the ending or the ending to his life, kind of subverting his own philosophy in that sense. And also he's very much a character that had a uh, strongly different view of the world and of nature than the filmmaker Herzog in this sense. Yes. Yeah. Which also I think is that the beginning point is really that conversation also between them where Herzog was not... Because he's done like movies like this before, like not too long ago, last year he released Fire of Love, I think, or The Fire Within. There's two movies about volcanologists who died also by a volcano. Also, you know, in that same sense, like they loved volcanoes, but ended up being killed by them. But in that documentary, he does present it as more of a, as an ode to these people. He doesn't necessarily see their quest as misguided or absurd, whereas I think with Treadwell, he was much more interested in an individual that was different from himself. And so it was more yeah. that you can see that in this story, it's more of an interrogation than just a celebration of 
the kind of sentimentality that Treadwell also had or felt towards nature and towards the bears. So yeah, that to me was right. all the things that are basically already captured in that initial uh, opening yeah. scene and from which the movie kind of uh, flows outwards. Yeah, pretty pretty early on, you kind of you start to pick up on a little bit, I think, of Herzog's kind of skepticism of at least the kind of portrait that Treadwell is painting of himself as kind of this, like, I'm fighting to protect the bears and I'm sort of the bear's protector. There's a couple elements, I, I think, of Treadwell's narrative that are interesting. One is that, like, hero of nature, white knight protection sort of narrative. The other is this narrative about nature itself, where he has mm -hmm. this very intrinsic belief, it feels like, that if he can interact with the bears in just such a certain way, then they won't kill him. You know, he talks about not showing weakness. And if he shows weakness, the bears will kill him. We see this too somewhat just in the, the philosophy of how he interacts with the bears. So those are kind of like his two two key aspects I see I see in in Timothy's sort of philosophy or ideology mm -hmm. that's driving what he does. Herzog, I think, is kind of skeptical of like both of those. One of the one of the early lines though that I think that like tips the audience off to Herzog's position, besides just the general irony of how it opens, which you've already talked about, but he says Treadwell saw himself as fighting the bad guys. There's some line of where he says something, I'm paraphrasing, but he says, Treadwell saw himself as fighting the bad guys, but it was a federally protected national park. And mm -hmm. he's kind of already outlining this case of, and this is a big question that I have throughout the film that I think never really gets answered because maybe there's not a good answer to it. But Treadwell has this idea that he's presenting, of I'm protecting the bears. And you're kind of like, what actually is he doing to protect the bears? Yeah. Yeah. He goes to like kids at schools to talk about bears. And I'm not sure if maybe the documentary footage that we're seeing here was intended to eventually be like a series yes. or like a movie that he would have himself made. But, right. but yeah, there's definitely a lot going on uh, with regards to the question of what actually protects bears. Right. Uh, right. We have this issue now in the Netherlands where we have a return of wolves, which... Oh, we yeah. hadn't had for like years, but they came like from the German border into like a national park that we have there. And so there's like this big discussion on what to do about them, because at the same time, you want to be, you know, there, there's people who want to see, see this as a sort of return of nature. Like we should give them space. They should have the right to be here or something along those lines. There's obviously farmers who are concerned about livestock. You know, there's sheep that have been yeah. killed or something like that. But there's also like, that's I think an issue that was also shown in this movie that when people come close to these animals in a non-threatening way, that's also, that's when the animals also become used to our presence and they right. become less fearful of approaching closer. And that might eventually also lead to dangerous situations, either yeah. for the animal as they come, you know, as they kind of mindlessly barge into what might be poachers, but also maybe... Uh, to human beings if like at some point there might be a family with children and you know some child does something that spooks the animal and then it attacks because it it's just not used to humans acting in unexpected ways and yeah, i think that was yeah. also mentioned in the movie where you it's not a good idea to make animals feel safe in our presence as weird as that sounds especially dangerous ones yeah we have bears where i live black bears not grizzly bears they're not nearly as threatening but anytime there's an encounter or like an attack sort of, you know, on one of the parks around here or something like that, it doesn't happen that frequently, but occasionally mm -hmm. somebody's dog will run after a bear or something and it'll, it'll attack. They will like go and usually put that, try to track down that specific bear and put it down because I guess the going theory is once the bear gets comfortable attacking humans, it's more likely to happen again. And so there is this interesting dynamic of needing to, I think this is related to the scene where he goes and he talks to one of the native Aleutians, uh, one of the native indigenous Alaskans about the bears. 
And yeah. he talks about the division that they've had for thousands of years between people and bears and how they stay away. And there's this sense in which Treadwell is kind of crossing this line. That, I think, is interesting to me because Treadwell has almost this like neo uh, spiritual, like sort of new age philosophy mm-hmm. of nature. And sometimes people who engage in that are kind of like pulling philosophy from indigenous culture. And so yeah, you yeah. might expect like this kind of one with nature, friends with the bear sort of attitude to align with the indigenous culture or whatever. But actually, in this case, the the modern stance of the culture of like, stay away from the bears was very much also <laughs> yeah. held, at least according to this one guy that yeah, heard yeah. interviews, was very much also held by uh, the native peoples in that area which kind of makes sense totally when yeah. you think about it. It's like, well, they're dangerous, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I really like the inclusion of that perspective because I think it also shows what I think was also the main internal struggle of Treadwell that Herzog also kind of touches on and I think makes it more explicit by uh, by showing this indigenous perspective that's rooted in yeah. like thousands of years of history or tradition. Um and that's the idea that we, as a sort of more modern society, have a kind of, we feel a sort of disconnect from nature. And that's, I think, also why this story to many feels so relatable to a to a point. Yeah. And that there's this kind of longing to return to nature and kind of be one with it. And then there's the, the struggle begins when you kind of realize that that's not really a thing that you can do, even though you might try, like... I feel like Treadwell also eventually runs into this problem where he's staying with the bears. He's trying to be, you know, he's petting the foxes. He's looking at the bees and he, he he's trying to be as best as he can to kind of transcend his own humanness and to become like this part in the bigger machine that is nature. But, you know, he, he eventually runs into the issue that he just, that there's a kind of a line that is uncrossable. Or that's that's yeah. maybe like either the distinction is not one that exists or the distinction is one that we cannot transgress or that we cannot cross. And I feel like that is a specifically modern issue. And that is also kind of highlighted by this guy who then says like, oh, yeah, you know, as you said, like we, that whole idea of harmony is kind of, we, we tend to project that with a sort of. You know, the elements from a Native yes. American, we often look back, or, or let me put it like this, we often look back at like Native American culture, for example, and we see that as a more harmonious way of living than the one that we have now, that one that's more like connected to nature. And, you know, in some sense that is true, but not in the sense that Treadwell seems to believe here that you can right. kind of cross that line and just be friends with all the bears, as you said. And right, yeah. uh, as that guy points out, like, no, there's, you know, part of like being connected to nature or or at least being in harmony with nature is also knowing like what boundaries to cross and which not to. Yeah. And um, yeah. that to me is kind of speaks also to the, the more philosophical concept where you have Herzog kind of trying to deconstruct that image of nature that uh, Treadwell has, where he sees like he sees the human world as something distinct and then nature that like the natural world as like one harmonious realm that he wants to venture into and be a part of. Whereas Herzog is more like, I see nature as indifference. I look into the bear's eyes and I see nothing but like a a bored sense of hunger or or, 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 um, like a hunger for food or something, something banal like this. To Treadwell, there was something like magical in the eyes of these animals. And there was like a harmony in the way they interacted with each other. Even though he recognized sometimes like they would eat their own, they would do violence and but i guess even there you know his frustration kind of revealed like he's sort of naive about like he he wants that world to be something different than it is and yes. Herzog is in that sense the more has the more realist perspective where he's like you know note him like this is what nature is it's all murder and violence and chaos and that's the one combining uh, the one like harmonizing element in this universe and that's what you have to contend with and which he didn't yeah. and which he ultimately ended up paying like the ultimate price for right yeah i think i think one of the interesting things that i see 
in that is Timothy's sort of inconsistency as a character or person. I mean, he's not a character, but mm-hmm. his his sort of philosophical inconsistencies where he also seems to have this weird acceptance of the fact that the bears might eat him. He talks about in several clips, you know, is this the bear that that might eat old Timothy or something like that, you know, paraphrasing. But he doesn't he doesn't seem entirely naive to the to the danger and there's hmm. this almost this sense of acceptance you almost get this weird romanticized sense that there's like a poet there's a poetic nature to him dying i, I think almost the more tragic element of the film which Herzog kind of tries to explore a little bit, but you bump up against the the inability to because of the footage that's available and the information is the girlfriend that was also eaten by the bear. Obviously, it's tragic that Timothy died by the mm-hmm. bear, but there was very much this sense in which he kind of seemed to understand to some extent the risk that he was taking, even though he he also simultaneously seemed to have this very romanticized version of if I'm just friends with the bear they won't they'll know not to kill me or they'll respect me and won't kill me or something or something like that yeah i think he conceptually understood the danger but i don't think he ever truly considered he would be killed by a bear yeah yes yeah and so there's there's a deep tragedy in that i guess maybe it's kind of and this is where it gets into sort of the mythologizing Mm -hmm. but it's poetic his death is poetic within timothy's own sort of mythology that he's creating where he almost becomes this martyr for the bears but when you strip all of that away it is just tragic when you look at it as just his own naivete kind of leading him and false sense of security kind of leading him into this position where he just gets tragically you know he and somebody he loves get tragically killed by a hungry bear the, mm-hmm. it it isn't and there's very much kind of a duality in that that i think is kind of presented here i think we know which side herzog falls on uh, mm-hmm. based on what he says but it's interesting to see that within timothy's own kind of mythology or yep. sense of narrative i don't think herzog really makes a moral judgment right on whether or not Timothy ever acted like truly irresponsible. Like I think he pointed out where no. he was like philosophically mistaken and maybe being putting himself at risk, but he was never like he should yes. not have done this or he he was wrong to do so and so. That's been one of the yeah. interesting parts revisiting this movie now is there's this moment where you have Timothy ranting about like the park protection services and he's like swearing at the camera and he's doing like even multiple takes and getting angrier with each one. And then at one point he's just like raving, like um, just incoherently swearing. And at that moment, there's a point where the audio cuts out and where Herzog her says, like at this point, like Timothy crosses a line that we're not going to cross. And, you know, apparently he called out some specific individuals and, you know, you can see that as in the sense like, oh, we're going to protect the people, these people's privacy, but... I think there's also a more of a moral code of conduct that Herzog has, which um, is obviously also something that comes back more significantly with the issue of the tape, because um, yeah, there's this tape that apparently when Timothy was attacked or when he and his girlfriend were attacked by the bear that uh, ultimately killed him, he did he, he turned on his camera or something, but it had still had the lens cap on, so there's only recorded audio and that tape still exists but Herzog chose not to reveal any of it basically but he did include it in the movie you can you get another one of these kind of staged scenes where he he himself listens to the tape and we just see the back of him with headphones on when while the camera is focused on um, his old girlfriend who who is now in possession of this tape and then he can see him listening to it and then he turns it off and he says like you jewel her name was uh, jewel you must never listen to this and you must never look at the photos that were at that i saw at the coroners and and there's just this weird tension between you know you can argue i guess that he 
I wouldn't say he makes a spectacle of it. You know, he, he obviously shows like a restraint, like he recognizes a border that he's not going to cross. And I think later right. in interviews, he also says like, or he like very, very firmly believed like he wanted to safeguard the privacy and the dignity of these two people and not show or like uh, uh, reveal like that audio clip. But yeah. at the same time, he does put it in the film. It, it is an is a subject of discussion. And he knows that the way he's doing it is is sort of this is where Herzog's own sort of mythologizing, I think, comes through. He knows the way he's presenting that is yeah. kind of almost like you said, I'm I, like, I wouldn't quite go so far as to say he's making a spectacle out of it. But oh, yeah, me neither. But I just couldn't find a better word. The whole way he's presenting that scene is definitely, I think, the most not suspect because I'm not really condemning anything Herzog's doing here. I think it's just mm -hmm. interesting to draw attention to kind of how he's he's presenting the information in a way that makes the most compelling narrative. Like him saying something, him saying, you must never listen to this, you must destroy the tape, almost elevates the tape to this kind of symbolic level mm -hmm. of just horror that... Yeah, yeah. It may, you know, none of us has heard the tape. Maybe it is truly that horrifying and like nobody should ever listen to it and we need, but mm -hmm. who knows? It could have been not that, I, I don't know. It's just, that's where I get into the, my, you know, the weird yeah. headspace of to what extent is Herzog turning this, elevating it, this into something that just creates a narrative that allows me to feel the horror that mm. might exist in this situation, even if it's not the most accurate representation of the facts, quote unquote, or mm. whatever surrounding that. And then also how he juxtaposes that scene immediately against this pr protracted scene of two grizzly bears fighting. Yes. He's, he yes. just kind of sets up in your imagination, oh, there's this horrible thing you can't even, you can't even, nobody should even listen to, destroy it of of the attack. And then I'm going to, I'm going to plant that seed in your mind and then let you watch two grizzly bears maul each other for five minutes and just let you kind of like sit in your own imagination of what you think you think happened. It's mm -hmm. it's this ec almost expert level of sort of horror suspense yeah, that yeah. he's conducting uh, that is is like. Yeah, I don't know. I struggle to find the word for what exactly he's doing there, but it's it's an interesting. It's, it's definitely very narratively effective in the sense as you said like it builds an image in your mind and then kind of supports that or enhances it by the specific juxtaposition of imagery and scenes like it's almost like the cool shove effect where you combine yeah. multiple images to create like a bigger interpretation and i think he definitely wanted to construct an image of even though like Treadwell wanted to show these bears as like peaceful and of the or friends of the humans in, in in a sense, like Herzog is kind of indirectly also kind of wanting to uh show the more like ferocious aspect and the more just the more like animalistic side to them that's kind of that's that's pretty much devoid of that sentimentality that Treadwell yeah. tried to c capture. He doesn't want to cross that boundary. He wants to he kind of has to work he has to work around it and uh, which in this sense, I think it's more effective. You know, the, the, one of the key elements in a horror movie is like not showing the thing, but more, you know, the thing that's unseen is often more scary than the one that's directly staring you in the face. And that's right. It's pretty much what's happening here. I think for the most part is that he uses all these bits and pieces to build this image of nature that is more dangerous in a sense than threat will presents it as. But while at the same time, I think that whole sequence with the tape, it also, I, I do think he wanted to address, he wants to bring up an an issue where he himself could cross a boundary, but then shows restraint. And in, in, in doing that, kind of juxtaposing that Treadwell had the same, situ or was in the same situation, but he did cross a line in that sense. He did yeah. transgress into a place where he shouldn't have been. Like literally, like legally, he was uh, not yeah. supposed to be there, but also more in that spiritual sense where he uh, had this more too sentimental of a view of these bears and of nature in general that put him in this dangerous territory. I'm pretty sure the only piece 
or at least the first piece, maybe the only piece of score that's used in the film is during that bear fight immediately after the the tape scene. I could be wrong about that, but mm -hmm. I just remember like hearing score come in in that scene and being like, I think this is one of the very few uses of score in this entire film. There's actually, that's good that you pointed out because there is an earlier one and okay. they, I think there's, uh, you know, there's more music, but more like, you mean actually like specifically scored music, right? Right, yeah. Like there's songs and like the, the country songs yes. in it. The scene that you mentioned, it does have the more ominous cello type music, but right. it actually that happens earlier in the movie. There's a piece of footage where Treadwell is in the water with a bear and it looks kind of harmonious, but apparently Herzog deliberately had a similar piece of music as the one with the fight to kind of undercut the sense of harmony that's there and foreshadowed in a sense that he's actually playing with an animal that's also capable of that thing that we see in that other scene that has the same music. Yeah, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah. So a little bit of uh, Herzog's uh, movie making magic. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> maybe this would be a good point to maybe return to sort of the because it we're kind of sort of adjacent to it, but return to some of the discussion surrounding metamodernism. One of the one of the things that I think Herzog is doing that felt like it was drawing attention to his own narrative building. There's that sequence where he's showing the kind of interstitial B-roll footage that that Timothy was shooting, mm -hmm. where he's kind of slinking around trying to look like this cool adventurer oh, yeah. guy. <laughs> And it's kind of comedic, and mm -hmm. Herzog knows this probably. You know, it 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 looks a little goofy. There's this moment where he's Timothy kind of does this take, and then runs off screen for a moment, and he's off screen for a little bit, and then he comes back in and does another take. And there's this moment where nothing is happening, and the wind is just kind of blowing through the trees, and Herzog gets really philosophical for a second is kind of drawing mm -hmm. attention to the fact that there's this deeper sort of truth in the image itself that comes through at the edges of kind of what the quote unquote the take is supposed to be at the boundaries of yeah, what yeah. is being staged by Timothy on the fringes of that that's where the real sort of truth reveals itself and then he seems to use that same maneuver explicitly himself in a couple moments, kind of like following that. One being the the scene you already talked about with the watch, which is hmm. staged and kind of feels obviously staged. But then there's a moment where it feels like the scene has ended and Herzog just holds on a second longer. And then Jewel says she kind of gets emotional uh, yes, he says it's the last thing that's left of of Timothy, yeah. I, I feel like there was another example of that. He kind of does that with Timothy's own footage quite a few times where he finds the interesting stuff on those in those fringe moments. But he does it with his own stuff as well. This is something he does in other documentaries, mm -hmm. not just this one. But that was one area where I, I felt it was interesting that he seemed to be kind of like drawing these parallels between his own sort of filmmaking and kind of the moments that exist in Timothy's filmmaking itself. Yeah, that, that's something that I really love about his movies. He's always searching for those, for something like true or like some sort of sense of truth or like that moment where I think that's what he said when with the image of the, uh, where Timothy goes out of frame, that where the, that's where the image kind of takes on a life on, of its own. I, I love yeah. that he does that, as you said, in many of his movies where he, every time, you know, as uh, where you as the audience would kind of instinctively feel like, oh, this is going to be the end of the scene. Like now there's going to be a cut. And then instead he lingers for a little bit and then some, somehow something, there's always something that happens. Like, and yeah. I think, yeah, he's just really interested in those in-between moments that really add a sense of spontaneity and texture to his stories and a sense of life beyond like the structured or the staged elements of it all. That's, I yeah, think that's yeah. what may have initially also attracted him to Timothy's story because he had so many hours of footage and it was just filled with 
these beautiful little moments like with the fox that kind of jumps on the tent and the bee that he thinks is dead and then miraculously wakes up again and, <laughs> yeah. or, the, or the fox that uh, steals his hat and he has to go uh, he has to go after it chase after it you know that's the, like the fun bit of it all like the the kind of stuff that as he said you know as a movie director you just don't have the time to really capture something like that that right. to really be in a place long enough for that place itself to reveal itself to you like you yeah you can only like go in capture whatever you can stage for the second and then you have to get out and he's kind of pointing out often in his movies like that you're missing like the good stuff like because like the magic happens often after you yell cut and get out of there and but he also i think he also does it to kind of probe for this deeper sense of genuineness the the watch example is a good one uh he does that in his other movies too um i also think the he does it towards the end where you have you see the very last time Treadwell is on tape and Herzog kind of speculates that he there's a sense that he is reluctant to leave the frame and you can and then as you watch him you see him, him indeed like he has a closing line and then he adds another one and then he steps back but he steps or he steps out of the frame but he almost comes back into it and then he has one more thing to say it's it's almost like that that creates that sort of mythological yeah. aspect of it all that there was you know not in the sense that I don't think Herzog believed that Treadwell saw that there was something bad that was coming. He was also like standing like in that shot, like behind him was the actual scene of his death. So it's not to say that there was some kind of spiritual thing going on, but at the same time, there was a kind of poeticness that can be yeah. felt through that shot and through Herzog's commentary on it and, or the way he kind of frames it. Maybe... You know, you don't know what was going on in Treadwell's mind. It was probably something else entirely. Maybe he was just thinking of a line and he forgot it. So he, he was just kind of prolonging his camera presence for a moment until he gave up and just quit. But that's where Herzog nevertheless turns it into this kind of mythological climax to yeah. that story or to his own, in some ways, to Treadwell's own mythology, which I think is really interesting. Yeah, I think Herzog seems to respect Timothy most as a filmmaker. He says that kind of explicitly at one point in the beginning where there's sort of a moment where he interviews some ecologists and they kind of defend his work a little bit. Uh, and he's kind of he's kind of dealing with this question of is what Timothy was doing kind of a net positive or a net negative? And there he presents a couple different sides to that argument. And then he kind of moves away from whether or not what he was doing was effective as an ecologist or for the bears and goes, I, as myself, you know, as a filmmaker have to defend Timothy and then mm -hmm. kind of shows these moments and talks about how he was able to capture this stuff that, like you said, you know, a studio director never would have been able to. And it seems like that's where Herzog maybe feels the most philosophical kind of commonality with Treadwell, where... Treadwell somebody who's like, I'm going to go off, break some laws with a camera and capture this amazing footage. And that's, I mean, if you had to summarize part of Herzog's thing, uh, that wouldn't be far from it. But mm -hmm. so I think I love that he kind of draws attention to that point of commonality. And it feels like that's where he most deeply, deeply sort of respects kind of what Treadwell was doing. The irony there being that's not at all sort of what Treadwell seems to see himself as, is that the filmmaking was just sort of a means to an end in what Treadwell saw as this battle that he was fighting against this vague, mm -hmm. these vague enemies, which another thing where kind of Herzog explicitly you already talked about it earlier where he said, I'm not going to cross the line of attacking these individuals or the park service. But in that moment, Herzog is kind of also explicitly commentating on, you know, we've had this run up of his his backstory, a little bit of his sort of history as a person. And Herzog kind of connects that to his fight against this sort of vague enemy of the bears and then his anger at like the National Park Service. Herzog 
says, I don't think that was his actual enemy. I think his real enemy on, in some way was sort of just society as a whole, that there was this kind mm -hmm. of deeper philosophical battle that was happening within Timothy Treadwell that Timothy didn't even really fully understand himself. Uh, but looking at it, it looks like he had kind of created this metaphorical landscape in which he could fight this battle against society and the man. And mm -hmm. his he had this very clear mission of protecting and fighting for these bears. Uh, and at least in the version, the way Herzog aligns the facts, aligns the information, it feels like that was very much something that actually gave Timothy purpose, saved him from alcoholism. You know, it kind of gave him a sense of meaning in his life you know, but it was also kind of shrouded in this sort of irrationality and naivete. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and artificiality too. And yes, th there's a lot yeah. of an interesting deconstruction also in the way Timothy tried to reinvent himself. You know, there's obviously like him going from an alcoholic to someone who is more of this environmentalist, which is obviously like an, a positive journey in, right. in, in, in most regards. But there's also that sense where he there's that one friend that kind of comes in and sort of undercuts like Timothy as a character a little bit by saying like, oh, he sometimes he lied about where he was from. He put up this fake accent and even like the, the little comments about his hairline that's receding, but he tries to cover it up by wearing his hair in a particular way. And that also kind of connects to what Herzog saw in the footage where he is not so much filming himself but really growing into a character that he's playing and that he suggests yeah. that it's kind of that it's um becoming more severe over the years like as the summers passed like he's more and more disappearing into his own mythologized self uh, to the point where he's deliberately hiding the people he's with like he presents himself as being alone in the jungle or in the jungle in the alaskan wilderness even though the as a friend or a girlfriend that was with him. That's the thing that you mentioned where he's doing like the takes of running through the bush as this yeah. great survivor that he has to do like over <laughs> and over again with different bandanas and sunglass on, sunglass off, just to ensure some continu continuity later on because he, he won't be sure what he's he's gonna wear in the other right. in the other footage. Because Herzog him he's obviously he's at the same time undercutting the kind of image that Treadwell was trying to make for himself while also in his own in this whole documentary he's also right. presenting not a caricature but he he is turning him into a character of some sort yeah. into a mythologized yeah. version of what would have been the real person and there's also that nice comparison or that interesting comparison where he uh, apparently when he flew over to the place that where Timothy went like he had to cross over this giant like glacier of like or like this icy rocky landscape right. and which he compared to the true like soul of timothy or like the inner landscape of timothy and so that's also like he's very he's also very methodical in or the herzog that is he's very yeah. methodical in the kind of image that he's presenting of or constructing of timothy and i'm not sure if i if i really have a point with that train of thought but that I mean, that's that's what I was kind of trying to get at, though, with yeah. like that's the element that I would define as meta modern in that mm. he's deconstructing one narrative, but he's not avoiding narrative entirely. He's also kind of transparently constructing a new a new narrative that he's presenting us with. Maybe that maybe meta modernism isn't the right label for that, but I think that's a specific move that I'm seeing done more frequently in kind mm -hmm. of whether it's documentary or or narrative in general that I think is kind of an interesting way of sort of dealing with postmodernism where you sort of have to acknowledge the boundaries and limitations of any given narrative that we construct. But at the same time, narrative also is kind of this inescapable feature of how we communicate and tell our stories. And so we're constantly in this place of kind of deconstructing mm -hmm. a narrative only to like replace it with something else of our own of our own making yep. and that, that very much to me kind of feels like what what Herzog is doing here I think the 
the admirable thing is, you know, some people fall in different places regarding sort of like Herzog's bending of the facts, so to speak, in his work. Mm -hmm. You know, some people pretty heavily critique his documentary work for that fact. I think we both kind of have an appreciation for and respect for that approach. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things that makes me kind of respect and appreciate that is that he's, even though he does bend things, sometimes in ways that he doesn't acknowledge, he's also one of the few documentarians who does, like we talked about earlier, seem to actually be just kind of presenting his own subjectivity at face value for what it is and just saying, this is what I think. This is where I mm -hmm. disagree. And it's so rare to see that, that I think that acknowledgement of sort of the subjective, per the inherent subjective perspective of the documentarian, a, a very valuable thing to kind of have in that space. Even documentaries that try to be as objective as possible are still inherently kind of presenting a perspective, maybe not like explicitly manipulating facts, but manipulating perspective so that you mm -hmm. see a certain narrative just in what you leave out and what you put in. It's, it's kind of inescapable. And so if we approach a documentary more in, as viewers, more in the way that I think Herzog wants to approach them as a filmmaker, where it's like, this is a narrative that's being presented by the filmmaker and that contained therein might get at a certain truth, but ultimately the facts are probably skewed to some degree yeah. by their presentation. I think it's good to view all documentaries that like as if that's happening because it's a more accurate way of understanding what like a narrative presented in a documentary is. Yeah. I think this is what Herzog himself would describe as his quest for like the ec ecstatic truth he's called it yes. or the poetic truth yeah. um i know i think he's his issue with like the cinema verite and many other documentaries is not necessarily that it's hypocritical or even like what's the word for that um not misleading but like deceiving like like that it's that they are deceiving of uh when it comes to the supposed objectivity but i think right. Herzog's main issue is that it's he called it the accountant's truth in more than one interview, like that it's just, right, right. it's it's boring. Whereas like he sees it as <laughs> the truth that as you can find it in a phone book. It's, it's not like to him, like human, like truth and ecstatic truth and the poetic truth. And basically like the essence of the human experience is something that's artificially created. Like we, you, you know, you talked about subjectivity like that. That's the stuff that exists in our mind. And so Herzog is always trying to find a way to use his documentaries to kind of bring that about through uh, the means of filmmaking. So kind of he embraces the subjectivity because that's to him where the real truth is. It's not like in the facts or in the objective things that are captured by the camera, but then the way you kind of construct that into a sense of a sense of truth that says something about who we are and what our like soul quote unquote is like and you know, yeah. I think that's why he compares like um, Treadwell's inner being to like that landscape, and he, you know, he makes that he wants to have us. He wants to have like images to things that happen on the inside, and he's done that more than once. There's another documentary too where he talks about the the inner landscape of someone's soul, and it's you know, he and then kind of juxtaposes with this literal landscape so that we get these images that. That are kind of that kind of transcend their initial face value into something that's more meaningful and more telling about us and who we are and how yeah. we view things. And I think that with Grizzly Man, he also does that maybe with with the movie as a whole, where he's trying to explore the nature not just of Treadwell's character, but also kind of the deeper philosophy or the deeper human spirit that's beneath it, and the kind of inner turmoil that it encounters, the obstacle that it faces, and where it's eventually like running into walls or reaching the limits of its um, of its own potentiality, and that's something that I always really admired about Herzog, and also that he has a, I think he's very much underappreciated for his compassion and this humanism. You know, I, I love the way he always seems to find these really interesting, fascinating, and often eccentric individuals and. 
there's, if, especially if you see a lot of his works, you can really get the sense that there's a great awareness of human dignity. Like even if he criticizes yeah. people or even if he puts them in these little awkward staged moments, there's always a kind of love for humanity that I think is present there at the surface and that you can yeah. kind of sense that there's never a Herzog movie that I truly walked away from uh, feeling more cynical or less inspired about human beings. Yeah. He's always managed to, in this, in Grizzly Man too, you know, Timothy is ob obviously a very eccentric character, but a lot of the other figures too, they, they have pretty strong pres presences on screen, even though they're just regular people. And I don't know how he manages to do it, but he always seems to find these people and seems to be able to extract something that's probably more it. Like he knows how to extract something real or something genuine from them that makes you immediately connect with them and ultimately walk away from his movies with just a yeah, just a great sense of the human spirit and of humanity yeah. in general, I think. Earlier you talked about the scene where he shows the bear. And I found that what he says there, I wrote I wrote it down here at the bottom of my notes. He said, mm -hmm. I see only the overwhelming indifference of nature. Yeah. And that's on this close up of this bear just kind of with its soulless little eyes. And I always wonder, or I was wondering watching that, if the bear looks completely indifferent and soulless to me in that shot because Herzog is saying it, or if that's actually there in the footage, I don't know. But the bear does look <laughs> particularly <laughs> indifferent and soulless in that shot. Yeah. And I think that's the beauty of he does seem to kind of end this film on the note of Timothy Treadwell is this guy who just got eaten by a hungry bear. Like that does seem to be Herzog's ultimate kind of position or like that's mm -hmm. the story. That's kind of how he caps the story that somehow doesn't undercut what you're talking about, which is that he presents Timothy with such a sort of reverence, even amongst the kind of critique you know, at no point does Herzog's kind of critique of or disagreement with Timothy feel like it undercuts his humanity or Herzog's own respect for that humanity. Uh, and I think that's a big part of why this documentary is so mm -hmm. beautiful um, and such a like has so much more depth than just what we would normally get out of. Here's the, you know, yeah. here's the story of a guy who got eaten by a bear. Yeah, I love that scene with the bear close up because it it communicates so much because you know, at the same time you could argue that maybe Herzog himself is projecting indifference on something that he simply right. cannot relate to or connect with directly, so it then he, Yeah. And but that you know, that discussion like those two visions on like you have Timothy looking into the bear bear's eyes and seeing one thing you have Herzog doing the same and seeing something else I think in that combination of the two there's also a just a sort of broader realization about the limits of our own being and that and and the kind of tragedy that there might be some ecstatic truth like right behind the eyes of those bears if only we could like read it if only we could peer into it but somehow you know we're forever like closed off from like the inside of it, we're always like stuck on the outside of that. And yeah, that, that might be part of the whole, the inner turmoil, I think he, Herzog called it, that um, yeah. Tim Timothy was also dealing with. And that I think we all as human beings have to contend with at some point, like that disconnect from the universe and of nature and that desire to be part of it. But I am the Lord's humble servant. <laughs> that, scene <Yeah. laughs> that scene is so funny to me where he uh, curses he he just films himself like cursing all the different gods that exist mm -hmm. uh begging for or like because he's so angry that it hasn't been raining and then it hard cuts to it raining <laughs> downpouring on the tent and he just says i am the lord's humble servant <laughs> <laughs> i feel like that kind of captures that mm -hmm. that tension as well between a desire for like an, a feeling of inaccessibility and then but also this like desire for meaning in these, these yeah, yeah. events that are happening outside of us. Yeah, he definitely, he kind of skips around between being completely frustrated by the world around him and then seeing himself indeed, as you said, as the Lord's humble servant as being <laughs> absolutely like included into it. 
it's uh, one of the great yeah. challenges of uh, being human and i think if you i think herzog in general is a great movie maker that continuously explores that tension but yeah grizzly man you know it's still his most popular film i think it's uh it's most accessible one in many ways and yeah if you're unfamiliar with herzog i think this is a good place to start and but even though i i, I definitely recommend you watch his other documentaries too because he has uh, yeah. many great ones even herzog's worst movies are interesting in some way he always, always interesting yeah he has a very like just do it attitude towards filmmaking that's why he has made so many films he just goes for it whenever he gets an idea he did a documentary um encounters at the end of the world where he goes to antarctica a uh, little fun fact here by the way herzog is the only director who has made a movie on every single continent uh in history which is pretty cool. That's, but anyways, he went to yeah. Antarctica and he found these divers that they were filming under the ice, like under the water, which to Herzog felt like such an alien landscape that he used that footage to make uh, The Wild Blue Yonder, which is this pretty terrible little science fiction movie. But it it did incorporate like those actual images from uh, below the ocean of Antarctica, which nevertheless, you know, even if you make yeah. a crappy science fiction movie, then there's still like <laughs> mesmerizing imagery to behold. Yeah. And yeah, I think that's, that's something that Herzog does like no one else, like he knows exactly where to find something special. And then even if he wraps it in a, uh, lackluster package, watching his movies is never like a wasted and I wasted yeah. 90 minutes or two hours or however long they are. I know we, we already have gone for a pretty long time, but since this is Herzog's maybe most known documentary and he has a mm -hmm. ton of other work, maybe it would be fun to each recommend another of his documentaries to the listeners. Oh, yeah. Just one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we can each, <laughs> we'll each recommend one. I'm yeah. going to go first because I want to, I want to steal uh, Lessons of Darkness, which is one of my favorite films of all time. It's probably my top 20. And it's just a very hurts everything we've talked about in terms of Herzog's mythologizing applied to a story or footage, mostly footage of, I believe it was the Kuwait oil crisis. Uh, there was a bunch of oil leaks, uh, spills essentially, and he sort of philosophizes using footage of that and then shows kind of the attempts to kind of cap these wells and stop the flow. And it's, uh, it's a terrifying documentary, mm. in my opinion. So uh, I definitely recommend everybody check that, that one out. That's a good one. That's Herzog is more like experimental stuff, which yes. is also really fascinating. Aside from the ones I've already mentioned, I think I'm going to go with one of his earlier movies, uh, which is called Land of Silence and Darkness, which I think is one of his most humanistic movies. It's about It's a documentary about people who are both uh, deaf and blind and so they can only communicate with the world through touch and he kind of goes into this community where you know it really goes into like the community of these people and the way they teach each other to communicate and 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 really kind of overcome the obstacle of wanting to connect with the world but feeling limited because of you know the restricted senses that they have and there's some tragic stories there like this uh, children that have been pretty much neglected because they, you know, no one knew how to communicate with them. And so they didn't have even, they couldn't even like develop in a way that children without such a handicap would. And so there's this, there's this deeply compassionate attempt from Herzog to portray these people in a way that still, that is almost desperately in search of their humanity and in search of a way to kind of bring that out and to in a way just reveal like even if people are limited by what they can communicate and what they can perceive there's still a humanity within them that's um as rich as uh, anyone's basically so yeah that's uh, of all the movies i've seen like pretty much everything he's made like that's one that's really stuck with me 
Great. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoy this podcast, you can support it by supporting our sponsors and also by checking us out on Nebula, where you can listen to the next episode of the show right now, a week ahead of time without any ads. Again, you can do that by going to nebula.tv slash cinema of meaning and signing up for Nebula. When you do sign up for Nebula, you will also get access to our bonus episodes, most recently, we did Damien Chazelle's Babylon. We also recently did Avatar 2. We had a dis great discussion about that, but there's a bunch of other bonus episodes up on there. On Nebula, you can also find our regular YouTube content. Often early, we both have some exclusive content that's on Nebula. Tom has a class about analyzing film and finding meaning and stories and all that stuff on Nebula as well. So. There's a lot of great stuff you can get from us on Nebula. All the information on how to sign up is in the link in the description. And we will talk to you next week.